Hello everyone, I'm Bablet Jonathan. You welcome to this edition of the Inside on Nikinox Television. In this edition of the program, we're going to be talking about violent extremism in Cameroon and on the African continent at large. For close to three years down memory lane, several persons have died. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced. A lot of destruction has been recorded in the two Anglophone regions of the Republic of Cameroon as a result of violence. Many have died. Many have suffered as a result of the Boko Haram atrocities in the far north region of the Republic of Cameroon. And many are still suffering. And many, of course, are still being killed. And even in the east region of the country as a result of sporadic incursions by uh, separatists or better still rebels from the Central African Republic, notably Silica uh, rebels. And of course, this is practically the same situation in many other African countries that are suffering as a result of violent extremism. We'll talk about this in this edition of the program. Meet our guest in some few seconds. Thanks for staying with us, our guest in this edition of the program is a prominent Nigerian civil society leader, Hamsatu Alamin, is a member of the African Union Network of Women Mediators. She is the founder and executive director of Alamin Foundation, a non-profit, non-political, and of course non-religious and non-governmental peace-building organization. She was an educator historian, gender activist, author, and a freelance writer who turned human rights defender and advocate and peacemaker with the emergence of the Boko Haram insurgents, insurgency in the northern Nigeria, notably in Maiduguri. And of course, uh, she served as the regional manager of the Nigeria Stability and Reconciliation Program, NS. RP. Madam, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to start with uh, the situation in Cameroon before we extend to the African continent at large. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your uh, opinion about what's been going on? Well, the part north, uh, northern part of Cameroon, I consider it is exactly like my own part of the country. We are neighbors, in fact, we have the same language, same culture, same every uh, social or cultural uh, livings. And therefore, in fact, the uh, Boko Haram insurgency that started in my degree and then gradually split, swell over to the other part of Nigeria, and then subsequently, I think Cameroon is the first to be affected by this crisis. Perhaps at that time, when the Northeast was battling with that crisis, people never paid attention. Rather, they just saw it as a problem belonging to the people of the Northeast Nigeria, particularly the Kanuri. Therefore, no appropriate measures were taken to, to actually address the issue at the periphery. Therefore, some of these boys, when they were dislocated from my degree, many of them in fact moved into the Cameroon, went and settled around Kolapata and other areas which are neighboring us, and then they started causing mayhem, in fact, more than even what I've obtained in, uh, in the northeast part of Nigeria. And perhaps, I don't know, but perhaps Cameroon also, they did not focus as such as like the Nigerian authorities did, and then gradually this problem also now is now taking uh, spill, uh, sorry, uh, spilling into other parts of Cameroon. In fact, I'm just learning recently that the south, uh, is it the northwestern part of Cameroon that the borders around, the, yes, the it, yes, that borders around eastern Nigeria, some part of Adamawa, and then to central Africa is also in, engulfed in this um, militant crisis. So the little crisis that we overlook and others have now come to engulf the whole country. And Cameroon has to be very proactive, very proactive in the sense of addressing the root causes. What were the root causes? In fact, like the northeastern part of Nigeria, the far north, I can say, there is abject poverty, there is illiteracy, there are no good infrastructure. Youth are just left idle. Eh? An army of unemployed 
um, illiterate boys are taking over all our streets. Children are left without good schools. So therefore, in fact, when there is an, any opportunity like violence or extremism and others, these extremists find ready recruits in this um, uh, uh, army of unemployed and then illiterate youth. Because, of course, nobody who is educated and enlightened can ever believe in some of these ideologies that the extremists uh, preach. But the young mind, when you leave the head empty, and then it is always yearning to be occupied. And then if you are not ready to occupy it with the right thing, then that mind that preoccupies itself with whatever that comes its way. And that's how I see the problem. All right. Apart from uh, idleness, which you're highlighting there as a factor that promotes violent extremism, uh, what are some of the uh, what are other issues that have been promoting the violence uh, that is uh, recorded in the northwest, in the southwest, in the far north? and even in the uh, eastern part of Cameroon. Mm -hmm. other, pa other factors can be, you know, grievances. When there are grievances, over the years, grievances are being generated. Conflicts are taking place. But nobody cares to address what is the root causes of this conflict so that these grievances are not addressed. And then in a situation where more than 70% of the population, that is women and youth, are excluded in anything, in fact, this society will never know peace and this is a common feature across all African countries and then in a situation where the architectures that are saddled with the responsibility of managing peace the architectures the structures and mechanisms that are saddled with responsibility of managing our peace and security like the military like the government itself and then like even the institution of traditional uh, traditional institutions or religious institutions that were respected and then the youth listened to when they have become weakened when their relevance have been eroded Therefore, they cannot manage conflict as they come. So therefore, and then look at the, um, uh, the borders in these areas. Like now, Cameroon, both Borno and Chad, in fact, four countries are bordering this place. And the, all these one countries, you find the very forest borders where you can easily transport arms, men, drugs, and then the small weapons, and what have you. So therefore, these are also facilitating factors. So therefore, if there are other some little trigger factors like election, or uh, election results, or political violence, or others, then it will trigger, and then major conflict will erupt. So therefore, in fact, and then uh, uh, coupled with this, in fact, it's the main institution of institutionalized corruption that have engulfed the African countries. Cameroon cannot be an exception, of course. So when there are uh, patrimonial politics with institutionalized corruption, with bad governance and others, this governance cannot control the, both the human and then manage the human and then material resources. So therefore, confusion occurs. And then any trigger factor will now... Uh, uh, lead to violence and then this violence will be difficult co to control under different names so they can be separatists, they can be um, Boko Haram, they can be bandits, they, so you give them different names. But actually the main uh, the trigger factors that impact fuels this cycle continue to be same and they were never addressed. And nobody cares to address this cycle of violence so we, it goes, it, it keeps rolling round and round unless people focus to break this circle then this violence and then the circle of violence will continue revolving around us and as you indicated uh, some few seconds ago uh, it's actually been uh, a little difficult for the Cameroon government to control the violence uh, that has been uh, recorded this far in the northwest and southwest regions of the country for close to three years today and even the Boko Haram atrocities in the far north region of the country uh, where is the problem government has been undertaking a series of actions creating institutions and uh, undertaking peace missions so these uh, parts of the country hit by a crisis but you know the situation has continued deepening especially in the northwest and southwest region. the problem is governments always focus on on counter-terrorism response militarily. And believe you me, no conflict or violence has ever started by the barrel of the gun. It must have started with disagreement, with argument, with some talks, and then when all this fail, then you see it erupting into violence. And therefore, 
the solution to these problems too can never be addressed militarily alone. But when situations have been allowed to deteriorate to a level that like this, that blood spilling all over, killing is very, very rampant, we cannot of course do without the military um, uh, counterinsurgency operations, but at the same time there is no how we can avoid dialogue. It is only through dialogue to understand. Dialogue doesn't mean we are competing. Dialogue doesn't mean that we are still quarreling. Dialogue is to understand. So no matter how vicious, no matter how bad, no matter how uh, atrocious a, co uh, a group or an individual is, that individual or group needs to be listened to. But once you ignore them, you turn deaf ears to them, you don't listen to their grievances, you don't listen to their demands, then it may be something reasonable. But unless you come to sit with them, give them a good listening ear and then understand what they want, then you also now will have the opportunity to translate, to translate what you think is your position as far as that is concerned. So among that, between the back and forth, then both of you can come to a common, uh, 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 one, a common ground. But so long as the other party, because, because they have the mandate, because they have the power, because they have the weapons and the resources feel that yes, they could not listen to the other party, then you are opening doors for them to impact, invite others across the country. Like in you are neighbored by uh, is it DRC is not very far from here. Nigeria battling is with is Boko Haram now, uh, but uh, from Upper Mali they are coming out in through Niger and Chad. So they will, they will inc uh, be inviting all these extremist groups will be inviting their cohort from across the country to come and then compound and complicate issues to you. That's why people like us, peacemakers, are always advocates of alternative approach, which our governments are never keen to listen to. Listen to. But that is the only, the only way out is while you execute your military operation, you have to invite people for dialogue, to sit down, understand what they are want, what they are talking about, and then so that you also have an opportunity to present what your stand is, and then along the line, then you can understand each other and then reach a common ground. In a short while, we're going to talk about that in greater details. That is the way out of uh, the uh, violence and, of course, the security and uh, polit socio-political tensions. We're going to talk about that in, in a short while, taking off from the keys of Maiduguri, where you did a lot of work with other stakeholders to uh, restore relative peace. But before that, I want us to examine a little further the uh, actions that have been undertaken so far, uh, which some critics say have yielded little or no fruit because for three years down memory lane, that is as far as the uh, Anglophone crisis is concerned. It has continued deepening. Thousands have been killed, many displaced, and hundreds of thousands are living in very precarious conditions today. In the meantime, the government of the Republic of Cameroon has sent um, peace missions, uh, sent authorities, the former prime minister, the present prime minister, and other authorities to the northwest, to the southwest, to preach peace, to tell the people, uh, let us find a way out of this uh, situation, to tell the pro-independence fighters, the separatists, the extremists, drop your guns, come out of the bushes, uh, giving them assurances and promises on, on how they're going to protect them and so on. Mm. But till now, uh, the situation has continued deepening. You know, everything What's your depends. Take on all these measures, mm. all these actions that have been undertaken. Yeah, this, uh, yes, you are just telling me this, but everything depends on the sincerity of forces of the authorities. You know, in most cases, these extremists have been allowed to grow wings, have been allowed to take roots. They have become stronger. They have created networks. They have created allies. So they also have now become have some powers that they feel they can contend with whichever government is on the ground. At certain level too, they will not even trust the government. In fact, governments across our regions are never trusted by even we, the ordinary people, not to talk of people who are taking up arms and then demanding for something from them. When there is no trust, believe you me, there is no how, no matter what delegation, no matter whoever went there, so long as that trust has been broken, 
so long as it has not been built, so long as you are not able to win their hearts and minds, then there will be challenges. And some uh, civil society and political leaders uh, like yourself uh, think that there is a problem at the level of the truth. They also can analyze situation. Yeah? And then when something continues to persist, a government that has the mandate, a government has, that has resources, a government has, that has the power, still cannot be listened to by a group of few. How many are these extremists? When you now make assessment of the whole larger society, perhaps these extremists may not constitute, constitute something like less than 3% of the population. But that 3% of your population is now holding the whole country to ransom. So therefore, there has to be, there are some issues, you know. In, the, in every complex situation, there are the economies war or the economics of war. Sometimes, you know, there are complex entrepreneurs. They can be in the society. They can be inside the government too. There can be some conspiracy theories also around those conflicts. And then there are also some um, uh, uh, other actors who may be impact, whose interest is perhaps not to end that conflict, but just to keep sustaining it. So people will, the sincere ones can be pursuing the peace, logic towards our, 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 but it will be difficult for them to pursue it to its logical conclusion because there are other actors who are, by the way, in fact also pursuing their interest of sustaining the war, others who, are, who have the interest of maybe selling arms, some others who have the interest of maybe selling their drugs and others so different stakeholders have different reasons to see to the once conflict has gone violent, people have different reasons to see to the sustenance of this violence. So therefore the sincere people among the community, for example like women, women groups and then the youth who are always the victims of the violence from all ends, in part have to be have, have to come in they have to be mobilized everybody have to be mobilized so that to impact and they really map the situation who are those people who are the wheels in the spanners of progress who are the prime movers who can facilitate the active peace and others so that they can all come to bear on the government support the government and then make peace a reality and there have been some mobilization uh, as far as the case of the uh, northwest and the southwest regions is concerned. There have been some mobilization at the level of civil society organizations, political parties who have been talking, non-governmental organizations at local level and at the international level, institutions like the African uh, Union, institutions like the uh, European Union uh, and many others, Human Rights Watch and so on, talking. but. Many uh, simply um, decry uh, the point that their voices are either not heard or they are accused of inflicting figures for their personal gains or they are accused of wanting to destabilize Cameroon and so on. Who is making that accusation, if the, I may ask? The government authority. Very good. So now there is clear a misunderstanding even between the government and those actors who are coming in between. So therefore, how will that problem be ever be solved? Could ever be solved if the government does not risk, um, uh, um, trust and then respect the, the people who have gone in front of it to mediate, to negotiate, to end this war. And likewise, these same people may also be accusing that government of not responding to the yearnings and then aspirations of the people to uh, achieve lasting peace. So when parties are accusing, pointing, accusing fingers at one another, not sitting down to understand what actually is the problem that the two parties are arguing, then the extremists become stronger and then keep perpetrating the violence. And perhaps another group at the back may be aiding these extremists to continue perpetrating the violence and then so that the government will never know peace, neither will the um, uh, other actors that come in between can ever achieve what they want. And then the circle now continues. And this is what the general trend across that for years now the Boko Haram crisis in Nigeria is now taking, a, we are going into the 10th year of the crisis. And then in Cameroon, look at what it is becoming, only God knows when it will end. In DRC, it is taking uh, uh, now decades, 
continuous war. So there are unless stakeholders, I, the issue of trust is very, very important. Unless stakeholders can trust each other and then sit down and then listen to understand each other and then confront the problem on a common ground. Honestly, the circle of violence may never end and then to the detriment of the common man, to the detriment of our posterity. Who have been killed, who have been displeased. Oh yes, and then like us women who are even abducted. Yes, many of us women are even abducted destroyed and this is a distract another angle of destroying the whole society when you are girls and women are just being abducted sexually abused sexually violated and then coming back pregnant uh, uh, bringing forth babies who even the mothers do not know who their fathers are then this is another angle of destruction to the whole society that people are not yet focused on they are just focused on extremists and then the violence going on by the time they turn their attention to that th that nothing remains in that society the impact of the sexual assault oh, on, yes. the, on oh, the women, yes. on the girl children, and even on uh, school going kids and so on could be very That's far it. You know, there is one thing people are yet to come to terms with the reality of a situation. You know, the, uh, there is an adage that says if you want to develop any society, focus on their women and girls. Focus on the women, give them education, give them skills, give them capacity, then honestly that society is going to succeed. And now if we want to destroy a society also, the easiest way to do it is to focus on the women. When you focus on the women, destroy the women, destroy the source of that society, then you have succeeded in crippling everything in that society. And this is what our African nations are yet to come to terms with. Women, they allow wild conflicts go on, people focus on buying arms, on uh, focusing on the terrorist negotiation that will never, they will never succeed, and then do not protect girls, women, and then the, the larger society. So eventually the extremists in taking drugs and others will now focus and target the women. To they target the women, abduct them in mass, nobody even knows how many will be abducted to be, and then taken to be turned into sex slaves, violated, and then their dignity as women is being stripped of, uh, of them. And then by the end of the day, by the time they finish fighting the war and come back, the whole society will now be a wasted society. And this is what we are battling with. We in Africa, in Pag, we have been targeted. Our young men don't even know what it is. Our leaders are yet to focus their attention on it. Drug is taking over our youth. Because some of this war these young men are fighting is just senseless war. Hmm? Targeting only communities, rural communities who have never known or tested the goodies of life and then you go and then kill these people, slaughter them, burn the communities and others. So what are you achieving? It's not any, any government stakeholder that you are attacking. It's ordinary common citizen. So what are you gaining? Does it make any sense? It doesn't. That will inform you that in fact there is more to it, to the wars and then the violence, the separatism going on around us than actually what meet the eyes. I think our politicians need to be sincere. We thought democracy is something that we, ordinary people, participate to bring them to power so that they can, in fact, be on top of our interests and then safeguard it for us. But unfortunately, it is now in the era of democracy that all these buyer uh, companies are now arising and then taking their toll on our society, on our communities, on our human resources, on even our environment. All right, we're going to uh, take a look at what the newspapers reported this week, the press review. The Guardian Post reports that the National Rights Commission mounts pressure on the Cameroon's government to speedily implement dialogue proposals. The Horizon questions if the bill to fast-track decentralization is President Paul Bia's new pact with Cameroonians. According to the median, special status legislation grants autonomy to the northwest and southwest regions. Newswatch quotes Professor Juma, who says the decentralization bill is what Anglophones want 
in the special status. The advocate says Anglophone regions benefit special status. The scoop reports that France and Belgium mount pressure on the United Nations to urgently intervene in the armed conflict in the northwest and southwest region. The Sun, Bill and Decentralization Court. Government takes decentralization to its furthest limit. The Star reports that the Bill on the Promotion of Official Languages causes Belamoki to spit fire in the Senate. And the edition of the Garden Post newspaper says after secret exchanges between French members of parliament and Sisi Kwayuktabe, the Ambajinian leader is open to an indivisible Cameroon. The Voice. Ending three-year-long war, Ambajinian Government Council prescribes permanent resolution. The same edition of the paper reports about the killing of three female Sous de Pay workers in a crossfire between the two camps. According to the reporter, the Social Democratic Front Party, SDF, is being targeted for accepting to run for the 2020 municipal and legislative elections in Cameroon. The Post's Weekender. Tough talking Famine Dungo, Minister of Higher Education, rebukes protesting PhD holders. The Garden Post exclaims about the daylight armed robbery attack in the cathedral in Yaoundé. Eden, University of Boya and Bamenda graduates over 9,000 students into a jobless market. And finally, the Post newspaper reports that late Mekima Patrick, the great warrior, has been laid to rest. Coming up next, interviews of the week. Le texte a été ou l'article a été adopté dans le form initial. That's the big joke. Why are those people making those amendments? The parliamentarians that have been elected by the people are making those amendments in order to beef up to when I read the text, government bench says, no, the government a decidé de telle ou telle manière dont l'amendement a été rejeté. The government bench has taken this house to be a post office where you send letters and it just pass. In chambre d'enregistrement. No. I've been teaching in the University of Yaoundé 1 since 2011. And then up to now, this is my 10th year of teaching in the university. And so, uh, in 2011, when recruitment was launched, we were excluded. At that time, I, I was 40. Was not even at, by that time, I was waiting for my, my uh, attestation to come out. So I didn't postulate at that time. But with the hope that in the university we were going to be recruited, we requested for that recruitment. Quite all right. But unfortunately, those who are recruited are not those who ask for the, for the recruitment. We, who are now qualified as more than 45 years of age, I think we have saved the state. And honestly, the, the state should also see to it that if people can save the state for, for this time, for nothing, then the state should also re reciprocate. And so, uh, we have observed that if we cannot be in included in this, uh, in this recruitment, the special status should be established for those of us who are part-timers because it is unfair for you to teach students and they employ the student and leave you when you are teaching in the same university you will see your student to come and replace you Minister of State Professor Famundongo sent us sent to us some his some of his collaborators to ask up to come and meet him but the fact is that we have decided not to go there but to stay right here so that if 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 there is any discussion we can discuss here not upstairs we expect to be recruited and we're not we are not going to quit here without recruitment of all those we have been abandoned in this list in that list the diaspora wants to return home, but they have a lot of questions and fears. So if we're not able to answer those questions correctly, give them information they need, credible information they need, we will sit here every day saying, come back home, and no one is going to return. So we thought, find the diaspora which has already returned in the country and is working hard, and connect them with those out there.
Thanks for staying with us. We are still with our guest, Hamsatu Alamin, a prominent Nigerian civil society leader. We'll be talking now about the way out of the uh, violence that is uh, hitting many parts of Cameroon and the African continent at large. And uh, we're going to take off from uh, the example of Maiduguri. Mm. Uh, you, you were telling me earlier you did an um, extraordinary job there with some other stakeholders to uh, bring down the level of violence mm -hmm. and restore relative peace. Yes. Can we share in that example? Yes. Very good. You know, at the time when my degree is engulfed in that violence, the government, as I said in your case, responded militarily with the creation of that, what do they call this... Um, joint task force of military and then all security personnel. So at that time, these security forces do not know who a Boko Haram is. They were brought from all different parts of the country and then placed in our communities. So at that very time, the Boko Haram boys were also living inside the communities, like your current militants in the separatist militants do. They are living within the communities, inside their parents' homes and others. So they only go out and then launch an attack on the military, and then run back and then disappear into the same community. So the soldiers now who are strangers to our communities do not know who a Boko Haram is, to them, in fact, all of us are a community of Boko Haram. So when in their response, they will come and then set all our houses on fire. And then, in fact, um, uh, any youth, any male youth that comes out is subject to be arrested. In the process, several men, several of our youth have been arrested. And to date, they have remained missing forever. It was so terrible. In fact, I myself have even been arrested in that process, in one of such uh, incidences. In fact, my son who was coming from school with his friends, two of them were shot dead. He was also near dead. I was called to go and rescue him. When I went, honestly, I have to take him to hospital and stay there for days. So therefore, I said with this, honestly, unless we, the people of my degree, now start, in fact, going after these perpetrators of violence among us, and then identify since we know them, and then catch them and give them to the security agents, these people will continue finishing us while these boys also still will come and then take some of the, uh, translate some of the grievances on us. So either way, we will never be safe. And then gradually, when I was saying it, people were saying, are you mad? How can you go after someone with a gun? I said, but this is the way out. The only way out for us, because there is no how. In fact, when I was arrested, nobody can go and even um, uh, get, secure my release. It was I who argued and argued, and then eventually I was released. And when my son was arrested, nobody could go to where the military is with me. It was only I who went and then secured him myself. So therefore, gradually now, uh, this youth started going after Boko Haram. You could the yes. young people to... We didn't organize or... them. We were talking and then, yes, they also sensed it. Because nobody is safe at that period. Nobody is safe. Anybody, whether you are a student, a worker, there are some who are even bankers. Many of their mothers are I'm now working with them. Some are uh, working in the bank, some are students. So if there is any incident within my degree, once there is an incident, anybody, so long as you are a man, if you are seen on the street, soldiers will arrest you, take you to the military barracks, and when they take you, there is no how you can go out. You are just a Boko Haram, and then many of them have died. Now it's getting to eight years. Up till now, we did not hear about this voice. So therefore, the youth also sensed it, because they are the ones that are the victims. Yes. They are seeing their colleagues who are being arrested and then taken and then they never come out. So what can they do? So they were they also heated. So they started going after the Boko Haram with their guns, with their ordinary sticks. They will go after them. Many of our youth have been killed, of course. Some of them are living with disability. But that was the only thing that now brought us soccer. In fact, people like me at that time, I have to go to the house of elders, telling them now, these youth have started. What do we want? Why can't we mobilize them? Why can't we organize them word by word? But nobody could listen to me. So, in fact, I have to focus my attention to the youths themselves. 
I even went out of my way to seek for assistance for them from stakeholders outside the state. What can we do to support this youth? How can we support these young men who have come out, sacrificed their life to save our society? And, and after, that, after, a, after a while, there was after, some yes. relative peace. In oh the yes, in, in, in quite instantly. Because these youth know who the Boko Haram is. They know every household that has, has a Boko Haram member. So therefore, if Boko Haram comes and kills anybody, this youth will go after them. They will catch them. Sometimes they will succeed in killing the youth. And they will go and mobilize and come back. The whole youth in the community will again team up. So we took over responsibility for our own safety and security. Mm. And that is how Boko Haram was pushed out of my degree. But that's quite difficult to accept. I think uh, something like that has been going on in the far north region of the country with the vigilante communities. Mm -hmm. Some of them have equally died, mm -hmm. uh, and I think they have also contributed mm -hmm. to uh, haven't, they, haven't they succeeded? Uh, reducing, reducing. Yes. Oh, but, yes. but, but that's quite difficult. To accept, it's quite difficult to, to, tell, to tell a young man today in the northwest and southwest. You don't have. Uh, you don't they, have they, to tell them. To, they need to go against uh, to to fish out the separatist fighters. You know, you uh, don't have to tell them. Be a suicide mission mm -hmm. to some of them. Some of them will see it as a suicide mission. In fact, common sense informs them. You don't have to tell them. They are seeing young men like them dying just like that for nothing. Yes. So therefore, you have to take responsibility for your own safety and security. And during when Boko Haram was holding territory, even fellow women have become fighters themselves. Fellow women were the ones saving men, women, and children from occupied territories. I know of certain women particularly Burma local government who have taken upon themselves to be rescuing men they contribute their clothes, wear it for men so that these women will rescue them eventually some of my fellow women have even been caught by the Boko Haram and then slaughtered in public to serve as a deterrent to others yes, you know when things have gone bad, certain people have to make sacrifices there is no how impact people can gain peace without making certain sacrifices. So, so this is what the youth in my degree undertook. This is what the vigilantes in northern Cameroon undertook. And without that, there is no way. Yeah, but with the case of Cameroon, for example, um, just like what you were highlighting earlier in my degree, uh, in eastern Nigeria and so on, talking about some young people who are arrested on the road and taken to military barracks until today, eight years, down memory lane, you've heard nothing about them, don't know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. it, it is practically the same situation with mm -hmm. the case of the Northwest and the Southwest regions where the military, civil, the elements of the National Armed Forces are accused of committing atrocities, killing persons, burning down houses uh, and entire villages uh, and so on. So in this context, how can this uh, strategy you know, in fact, in fact, that is the only way that made the military to be friends with our people for, a while, for a, during that period. In fact, to date, men, women, and youth in my degree would tell you Nigerian military is even worse than Boko Haram. Why? Because the kind of atrocities committed, as you have even rightly witnessed, Yes, sometimes you may not blame them because they don't know who the perpetrator is. So when they come, anybody they see is a victim, and then any house they see is a house for the perpetrator. So they will just destroy it and then uh, arrest anybody and go, and then eventually the hundreds of thousands that were arrested were never accounted for. They are perhaps gone forever. And then it is also, this also is generating another problem to us. Now, in fact, we have more than 3,000 mothers who are demanding for accountability for the, from the military of their sons who have been arrested, whom they have ne never seen. And then we have about another more, almost 3,000 women who are now looking for their husbands, accountability from the military. Uh, 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 and then eventually, this kind of uh, thing is generating grievances that in fact there are my fellow women who have even wanted to join Boko Haram so that they can take their revenge on the Nigerian military. I know of women my same age, same age as mine who have now even gone to join the extremists. I know how I have suffered to bring them out and now some of them are the ones leading the network of 
mothers who are seeking for accountability. So uh, this also generates another problem for us. So and then it is all over across. And then for the military who are supposed to be the institution that is supposed to protect our lives and property, who are supposed to safeguard our territorial integrity, an institution that all of us are supposed to be proud of, to support and then even protect. Now, now it has come to a stage that the ordinary see them as even worse than extremists. What kind of a disaster is that? So therefore, we have to address it. And then when we have seen such failure, then we will have to take that responsibility for their own safety and security. Some of them have to be, be, become the sacrificial animal, of course. Yes, you are fighting someone that is no how you, uh, you can be, impact, uh, be, uh, be a victim. So, in fact, many people have been killed, even the youth, women, children, and others in our houses, and others who have not even gone out to the war. Even stray bullet can come and kill you. So, therefore, death will come when it will come. Therefore, people have to do the right thing, come out, make the sacrifices, and then get to the root of the problem and get it solved. And the question now is how to address the current situation, for example, in Cameroon, and by extension, other African nations that are suffering uh, the effects of violent extremism. What are those right things that should be done, as you indicated, and by who? Mm. There are so many. There are the counter-terrorism which will be done, should be done by the government with support, of course, they are getting support from international communities and others. So they are getting the support in terms of weapons, in terms of training and others, because the situation has been deteriorated to a, such a level that you cannot do without the military counter-terrorism operation. Okay, fine, let it continue. But believe you me, that will not end the problem. So therefore, at the same time, we have to impact the youth the, even the illiterate youth and then the vigilantes and others have to come up. Recently, the new governor in my state, in fact, have even strengthened the vigilantes, have now identified the local hunters to start giving them allowances so that they can also now complement the military in the war against the terrorism. And then likewise, CSOs, we um, civil society organizations shouldn't be left behind. Because there is a lot we can do. Believe you me, if our government are listening to even ordinary people, ordinary women without mandate, without power, without resources like me, honestly, we could have even ended Boko Haram before it becomes something like this. And even to date, even to date, take it from me, there are a group of those boys who want peace, who want this war to end. But the military and then the government and its agencies were just desperate, saying that they must defeat them, they must kill them, uh, when we know it is not possible, and then dragging this thing long, and then wasting our resources, wasting our land, wasting our people. So women, civil society organization, we women by the virtue of being mothers, by virtue of being grandmothers, by virtue of being wives, yeah, we have all the stake. All our stakes are suffering. Our sons are being killed. Our husbands are being killed. Our environment is being devastated. So what do we have for posterity? And we ourselves are abducted, sexually abused, and then destroyed. So therefore, it is just in our interest. Women have the capacity across the world. There are instances where women have gone down into the bush to talk to these extremists, to appeal to them like mothers. Huh? And then really they have listened to and adhered to. But in a situation where you feel yes, women are not nothing and then cannot do anything, and then where a situation where you feel the youth cannot sit with elders, they have no voices to be listened to, their, um, um, their views and contribution cannot be taken into cognizance. Huh? Now look at it, we people of my degree will never say this. Because it is the same youth now who now sacrifice their lives energy and resources to impact when one uh, sacrifices his life the question of energy and resources does not even arise a sacrifice their life to say uh, but so that we start enjoying relative peace and then the extremists and then the separatists themselves are also youths like them who have now taken up the arms and then they will die in the process also 
in, uh, in the course of counterterrorism operation or even in accidents through the IEDs and others that they are operating with. So therefore, who else will now face them but their fellow youth? So therefore, the contribution of each and everybody cannot be underestimated. While the kinetic um, uh, approach continues, then the soft approach also has to take place in the one hand so that we get to the roots of these problems and then clear it if we sincerely want to end this crisis. And earlier you mentioned dialogue concerning the case of Cameroon, mm. the Anglophone crisis. You mentioned dialogue. Oh, yes. How should it be organized? Yes, dialogue, you know... Yes, when it has become such a regional crisis, maybe attempts have been made in, in, uh, in house. You have said ministers or former president or whatever have gone and others, it has not stopped. Perhaps the African Union have to come in and then maybe the Nigeria's neighbors also, different stakeholders, sincere stakeholders have to be invited into it and then a, uh, a committee of mediators be set up to come to really understand what is it these people want and what is it is the government um, uh, uh, trying to protect or defend or trying to hide from people. So therefore, after understanding this from different angles, then the, the two parties can be brought together to face each other for we cannot continue fighting these things. Uh, for how long can we fight? And how, how many years can, can we keep killing one another? There have to be an end. For the, an eye for an eye, they said, we'll keep, only keep, make the whole world blind. So therefore, there has to be a stop at one end. Somebody has to tolerate one. In fact, if the uh, separatists are so careless, senseless, and then insensitive to the waste of life and others, at least a government that has the mandate to protect life and property should be sensitive to its responsibility and not to keep responding to the killings and then keep killing until everybody dies. All right. The, your last word before we go, Hamza to Alamin. What, what would you say to um, the separatists? the government, all Cameroonians, all Africans with regards to violent extremism. Before I go further, let me ask you, are these separatists not Cameroonians? They are Cameroonians. Very good. So therefore, what are they going to gain by continuous fighting? If their fathers and forefathers have been behaving in the way they are doing, they couldn't have come to see Cameroon the way it is now, not to talk of fighting and then destroying it. Therefore, is it what they hope to live for posterity? Do the, do, don't, don't they have dreams for a brighter future for their own children and then for their own posterity? Uh, posterity? Don't they have hopes and aspirations for a better Cameroon to strive so that all of them can come and then enjoy, uh, to, to enjoy the good uh, goody of life and then declare Cameroon as one of the most progressive countries in, this, in the coast of uh, West Africa? So therefore, if they should, I'm sure if they have been listening to me, some of them will be saying yes, although some of them, if they are under certain influences, may deny it. But when they come to their senses, I think there is no right thinking person. In fact, when you are struggling to be separated, what are you struggling for? You are struggling to get a portion of that land so that you can administer it and then enjoy life uh, and then peace and security. So in the process, the other party also will not want to allow you to do that. So therefore, if you have that culture of destruction and others, even if you have gotten, even if you have succeeded in separating, will you ever, I doubt if you can focus to organize and then enjoy the benefits or the, uh, uh, the fruits of your labor. So therefore, fighting is not the best solution. In fact, as young men, I believe all of them are young men, should come and then put their arms down and then be listened to. If the government has not sincerely created any platform or any forum to give them voice and dialogue, I think this is the time. The government should officially and then sincerely declare a, a, a platform or a safe space where people who are interested in dialoguing can come, put down their arms and then be listened to. And then other intermediaries, 
if they cannot trust the government, they can openly say it and then so that other international mediators can come in. At the African Union level, at the ECOWAS level, or even at the UN level, people will be willing to interfere, to come intervene, to come and then listen to their own part of the story so that they also, the Cameroonian government also can present its own uh, section part of the story so that the two can be balanced and then peace will be obtained because there is no point in fact nobody can even celebrate at the end of his life to say that he, has, he is a factor to the destruction of his own country and then when a war has no end what does it mean that means you will continue fighting you will continue killing until you yourself are is no more and when you become no more what have you achieved and then when you have destroyed your country what have you achieved so we are just appealing to their reasoning to impact Put, that, that, put down their arms, and if they feel their government will not treat them fairly, then let them voice it out. Let the international community hear it, and then respond to it appropriately, so that the government of Cameroon can be influenced, the government can be persuaded to take to the path of dialogue, so that lasting peace can be explored. Thanks so much, Hamsatu Alamin. You are a prominent Nigerian civil society leader, a member of the African Union Network of Women Mediators. Thanks for accepting to be our guest in this edition of The Insight. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. In fact, Cameroon is also part of me. Also, my grandmother is a Cameroonian from um, around Gaundere area. Yes, my maternal grandmother, she is a Cameroonian, so I'm also part of Cameroon too. So it's my pleasure in part coming to this part of the country and then in part making my little contribution. Thanks a bunch. Thanks ladies and gentlemen for staying with us.